that cannot be on the uh, around sarcophagus. And uh, check, check. We see a lot of the same, uh, the same iconography we've come to. Check, from check. From the uh, uh, from the late bronze age, right? Check, check. Test, test, test. All right. Sorry. Awesome. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it was the. Uh, I'll take this one away. The game was. Okay. That's fine. Thanks so much for fixing it. Appreciate it. So um, that's better. A lot of the same, uh, the same iconography. I guess all that's going to be podcast too, right? So you can, that'll be fun. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so, uh, so again, some of the same scenes, uh, these presentation scenes, the same sort of iconography we've seen at places like Megiddo in the late Bronze Age, right? So uh, ivory carving, which kind of gets its start in Canaan during this time. Uh, you can see some of these presentation scenes, for example, right, an individual seated on um, a sphinx throne, right, with these, these wonderful uh, sphinxes built into the, uh, into the throne, receiving offerings, receiving bound naked prisoners, uh, these presentation scenes that, that, again, are quite common in the ancient Near East, uh, right, uh, about maybe uh, 150 years later. Again, the, the date of this is a little bit tricky, but uh, around 1100 to 1050 BCE, we see um, Ahiram at Byblos using the same kind of iconography uh, that we see in the late Bronze Age. So again, just tremendous amount of cultural continuity. Here's the same line, uh, Sphinx-backed throne uh, and libations, things being brought to him. Uh, and actually on the other side, we have a depiction of Ahiram and his, uh, his son between these lions that form the base of the throne itself. The uh, the land uh, in which the Phoenicians lived and operated was uh, squeezed between a, a narrow plain, as you can see here, between uh, the sea and the Lebanon mountains. So not a tremendous amount of, of, uh, of material, but primarily uh, the Phoenicians relied on fishing and uh, were known as uh, international traders. Um, they trade commodities and luxuries and, uh, and actually we have very early evidence uh, of, uh, of timber being exported as well from this area. So timber, right, we saw, for example, uh, in the reliefs at uh, Khorsabad, right, the uh, harvesting of timber from Lebanon. This is the region, right, where this timber would have come from. Uh, and Phoenicians would have been used to, to harvest uh, and, uh, and bring these commodities to the Assyrian heartland. Also, uh, they pursued the uh, metal market, exploited silver and iron mines in the Mediterranean, uh, and uh, really grew to, to kind of be the lifeblood of what's been described as an early example of world economy. In fact, we'll see that the uh, Phoenicians end up spreading uh, to the Western Mediterranean as well by, uh, by, the, uh, by the ninth century. These sites, uh, of course, are, are harbor sites, uh, so here's a, some images of Byblos and, uh, and Beirut Harbor. And they were able to do this um, through the use of a, a few new advances in maritime technology, uh, particularly the use of the oared galley or, um, or, or what's known as a bireme. Bireme just means like two sets of oars. Um, you, you would actually have a combination of uh, manpower, right, to, uh, to propel this vessel, right, so banks of rowers who would push this bireme, uh, or, right, you would actually have a sail as well. And this is really necessary for getting to these distant parts of the Phoenician, uh, of the Phoenician uh, empire. I shouldn't say empire, I should say the, uh, these distant trading sites that uh, the Phoenicians are able to establish. Uh, right after Byblos sort of takes prominence, we see Tyre taking power uh, in the 9th century. And then by uh, 841, uh, Pygmalion of Tyre is able to actually establish a trading colony all the way here, right? Um, very, very, very far to the west at the site of Carthage. Um, so, right, you really need these two methods of propulsion, both sails and manpower, to navigate 
the, uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, really, the currents and the, uh, and the wind patterns generally follow a counterclockwise motion. So uh, you can, uh, if, if you're actually traveling, depending on where you're going, uh, you'll either use sails or you'll use, again, manpower. Uh, and the timing, of course, it's much faster to sail than to row, but you actually can then get to these places like Carthage and elsewhere. So we can see all the way to Spain, uh, again, by the, by, the, uh, uh, by the 8th century. Um, so the Assyrians end up uh, establishing a presence in this region, right, during the reign of Tiglapleza III and Sargon II. And we actually have some reliefs uh, of these kings from, uh, from the site of Nar el-Kelb, which is a, a, a very important river crossing near Beirut. You can see it here. And this is an interesting site for a number of reasons. Um, most likely, again, uh, we, we, have a, we, have, we have a stele. It's, it's an unknown Assyrian king. The inscription, unfortunately, does not survive. Uh, but most likely, this is uh, a depiction of Sargon II establishing, again, you know, the sort of borders of, of the empire and uh, bringing those cedars, that metalworking, uh, the ivories as well of, uh, of the Phoenicians to the Assyrian heartland. And we can see here, he's actually set up this stele right next to the, uh, the inscription of Ramses II. Um, again, sort of symbolically conquering this very important river crossing. Uh, this sets a really interesting precedent, actually. Uh, after Ramses II started it, right, during his campaigns, as we talked about, um, Probably Sargon II continues it, but every conqueror of this region of Lebanon to follow, uh, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar, Asarhaddon, Marcus Aurelius, uh, even Napoleon, actually even after Napoleon, the British as well, inscribe a plaque in this area, uh, sort of following this tradition of conquest, um, putting their plaques up there. So it's, it's quite interesting, right? All the way from the late Bronze Age to, uh, to really the 19th century, this area of Nar al-Kelb has, has kind of been a, uh, an important strategic point, but also a place to sort of uh, to, uh, to post your, your victories. We, uh, we see that the uh, Phoenicians were brought to an extent under Assyrian control, but again, they operated quite independently. Uh, these are some, uh, some images from the Balawat gates of Phoenicians bringing tribute uh, early on to, uh, to Shalmaneser III. Uh, again, we've seen these before. Uh, resources, again, being brought uh, from uh, islands. And probably, uh, again, this, this might be Cyprus. It also might be the island of Tyre 